So, uh, maybe we'll end up finishing this today. This is actually a combination chapter four, some fifteen. Sorry, I think uh, our, our last point we talked about whatever that day was just giving up leisure in order to get more income. If you don't need the money, then you're not likely to give up your free time. But the more, but then there again, the more you leisure activities, the more expensive they are. Maybe the more income you need to make. So there's a balance there. We didn't talk about this. Oh, I know. Oh, I'm sure we talked about it at some point. Nominal wages. I'm sure we saw this earlier this semester. Nominal. The word of this is names. So this is the the name the, the, the number that's on the front of your paycheck. Where real wages, that's the purchasing power of your paycheck. What can you buy with a paycheck? I'm sure we talked about this. I'm thinking it was Will. We talked about him buying. Oh, he said some talk. Yeah. What? Yeah. How many? Not, he, he, Will's not working to get hundred dollars. Will's working for enough money to get hundred cans of sun drop. And then as price changes, even if his price, if his paycheck doesn't change, well, that's going to affect the number of sun drops he can come home with in a week, right? So if the price of the stuff goes up, the price of sun drop goes up. If his paycheck doesn't, he can't bring home as many sun drops. So what does he need to do? Either work more hours to get the paycheck bigger, or ask the boss for pay raise to get the paycheck bigger in order to maintain the same standard of living, drinking the same amount of sun drop that you drunk before. Is that ringing the bell? Yeah. Okay, I have a bad joke about ringing the bell. Um, except remind me again, it's what? It's not that good. And so, we did. So, if Will, if his paycheck went up by 8%, but the price of sun drops only goes up by 5%, guess what? He'll actually be able to buy 3% more sun drops because of the pay rate. It's not like, you know, the ball, he wasn't making $100 a week and making $100, $108 a week. Woo, I can buy eight more sun drops. No, his price of sun drops went up too, right? So when it does settle, you need to make sure that your paycheck is going up at least as much as the price of the stuff that you're trying to buy. So in Will's case, the only thing he buys is sun drops that he needs to be making, keeping an eye on the price of sun drop and then making sure he gets pay raises according to that. Um, why is the boss going to give him more money so he can give, bring home more sun drops this year than he could last year? Because Will increases his productivity. He's working harder, he's working faster, he's working better, he's got more experience, he's got more, he can handle stuff more because he's been there, done that. Because here's the thing, the boss gives Will a pay raise that, in this case, is greater than those inflation rates. The boss went from saying, instead of me giving you 100 cans of sun drop, now I'm giving you 103 cans of sun drop. What did the boss just do? Give away three extra cans of sun drop. So that's three less cans of sun drop than the boss had before. So why is the boss going to want to be making that sacrifice? If you're asking your boss to be giving you a pay raise higher than the inflation rate, you're asking to get a bigger piece of the pie than it was before, than you were before. Why is Paul going to do that? Increase in productivity. You are doing more. You're bringing more to the company. So. Okay, well, we're going to keep picking on you. You okay with that? Good. First of all. Uh, here. Uh, so, um, Will gets a pay raise. You end up with a couple of things. Number one, the pay raise might say, Will, Will might say, well, I was working $10 an hour, but now I'm making $12 an hour, I'm willing to work more hours. Woohoo! Because it ain't quite such a dead end job. I'm making more money, so it's worth my time to be getting off my butt. If I'm only making a little bit, seven and a quarter an hour, well, then I don't feel bad about calling sick and staying home for the Tuesday evening afternoon. But if I'm making ten or twelve dollars an hour, then maybe I'm just think twice about calling in sick and staying home and watching TV. All right. So the higher wage might encourage people to work more. It would encourage Will to be less likely to goof off and call in sick. And then it might encourage some of the rest of you. It might encourage Josie to decide, 
Well, I'm not interested in working if I'm only going to get seven and a quarter an hour, but if I can find a job at $10 an hour, $12 an hour, yeah. So you get workers that are already working, willing to work more, but then you get work people that are not working, suddenly becoming willing to work. I think that was dramatically true. But there might also end up being a thing, which uh, I think we handed it this the other day. Giving them higher wages may cause some people to work less. I think I asked this the other day, what would happen if you were getting paid what, $100 an hour or $200 or a million dollars an hour or something like that? Some of y'all would be like, I'm going to work as much as I can. And some of y'all were like, oh, I'll work one hour a week. And that's it. Work one hour a week, get a million dollars a week. And I'm good with that. How many of you would be good with that? Yeah, I work one hour a week, get a million dollars a week. Or the million dollars a week? Yeah, I worked for, I don't know, one week, two weeks, bank a quick 80 and then call it a day. Yeah, and then have the rest just gain interest for the rest of your life. Exactly. Um, I started to say I'm a simple boy with simple needs, but no, I probably would work like a solid month there and I try to make a couple hundred million, probably. So, but no. Um, yeah, because you gotta have a, at least one beach house. You have to have at least a yacht, right? As well as the house and a house on the lake and a different vehicle for every day of the week and a helicopter. See, and this is why people win the lottery go bankrupt after a month. Yes, because they buy all this crap. <laughs> yeah, they can't pay the tax on it. Yes, and you need some two or three million dollars in tax as you know. Um. I think last year I talked about my theory on what to do if you win a lottery. We'll have to pick. Maybe I'll stop class five minutes short. We'll talk about that one again. But there's a logic to it. Ooh, ooh, just my wife was talking to somebody the other day that was talking to somebody that she, Melissa, had a customer that apparently years ago won like $12 million in the lottery and kept it secret. Didn't change her lifestyle whatsoever. Even down to the point of like when her daughter was like turned 16 or whatever, bought her like a used car. Yeah, it was, there was a guy that was right, probably the same guy. It was right around the corner. Oh, uh, no, this so, guy that lives near where I live. Oh, he lives near Oh, okay. So. Yeah, this guy lives in South Hill. He did. He won, I think it was like 10. Didn't change his name. Yeah. Because uh, like, well, he was like, you know, because I don't want people to be hunting me down. And you know, I know you got money. You won 12 million. So you know, give me some money and I'll break in your house, whatever. That kind of stuff. And so, so. But then it's like, well, that's a little nurse. You have money, you can't spend it. Like, I don't know, just. So you got to spend your money away somewhere else. You, you buy a beach house somewhere, you don't tell anybody else. Like, yeah, we did my family, we're just going on vacation to the beach. You just don't say anything else to know that we're going to my house at the beach. So you have your house at the beach, you have the nice cars locked up in the garage with the security system there at the beach, and you live at home and wherever you're in the middle of nowhere. Or you just get a movie. Or you just have the movie to be done with it, yeah. Or just lie and tell people you're going to be around you by trucking. Get a couple of beers off that juice going in there, and then nobody will ask you any questions. Just keep on rolling. Anyway, I just spoke my ideas. So, the, <laughs> <laughs> the income of negative wages is maybe you strike a balance. The extra pay raise will let me cut back the amount of hours and bring home the same amount of money. Will got the 8% pay raise. So, Will, now he could work, instead of making work 40 hours a week, he could make, okay, $10, 10, 10 hours a week. He could have worked 10 hours a week and he was making $100. He could go to 10 hours a week and bring in $108, but maybe he was say, well, no, $100 is all I need, so now I just work nine and a half hours to get the same $100. Don't get that adjustment there. I'm doing them numbers on flying money. But just some of, some of us might do that. I might do that. If I got a little bit of a pay raise, and I might not try to spend as so much slinky time doing all these extra overload classes, and summer school classes, and that kind of stuff, flatten out. Try to keep getting so much gray hair. My wife won't let me. But we talked about this the other day. In reality, the supply curve 
for labor. When wages get higher, as they go up, people like Will say, I want to work more hours. People like Josie says, I want to start working hours. But as wages continue to go up, you get to the point where some people are going to say, well, I don't know if it works hard. You know, I can cut back the number of hours I work and maintain the same standard of living. Or then some of y'all are going to be like, you know, I'm going to make enough money. I'm going to find you that I'm going to retire significantly early, like next week. Right? So the actual supply curve actually bends back. And this is the only supply curve you'll ever see that bends backwards like this. The rest of them, they just sort of, for any other supply curve, for donuts, chickens, or cell phones, it just, it goes up. But this is one kind of, you'll see, one that actually bends back. So, but it would be nice to be up here quicker. Think about it, my need to work smarter. Make more money, I work less. So, um, that the supply and labor for the market is all of the people out there that are willing to work and how much time those people are willing to work. You kind of saw this one already. And when the determinants of the supply of labor change, your supply curve is going to shift. The, those determinants of labor that we talked about, labor supply the other day, things like work conditions, if the work conditions get better, more of us are willing to work. If the work conditions get ugly, less of us are willing to work. Changes in your lifestyle, you needs, you wants. Remember the story we talked about the other day about Loveline and her alien child, and suddenly she's got to pay for housing she didn't have to pay before. She has to pay for cars she didn't have to pay for before. She has to buy truckloads of diapers that she didn't have to buy before. So that's going to increase the number of hours that she wants to work. So that is going to be an increase in labor supply curve. Um, do I have it? Oh, I'm, I'm just looking at something. Let's talk about society for a, whole, for a moment. We're talking supply and demand for labor. Here. I was picking on Love Lane the other day. They lean Love Child, all that kind of stuff. Would you agree having a baby is going to increase your need for money? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so when pregnancy rates increase, you get this. It gets a little bit complicated because well, yeah, the more kids that you have, well, I can't afford to work because I can't afford to daycare when I have triplets and all of them, all three of the kids have eight tentacles each, right? So you may end up with a backward, but interestingly enough, what's been happening in the United States in the last several years, in the last few years, pregnancy rate has gone down. Yeah, it has. Especially the teenage pregnancy rate, which, hallelujah. So you're having people not having kids as often, and when they do have kids, they're not having as many kids. So that is putting some, taking away some of the pressure of, oh crap, I've got to work. So, and then for even y'all teenagers, the friend, y'all when y'all were in high school, how, how many of you friends, how many of them had jobs, how many did? A lot of them did. Because they didn't even, how many of you, how many of you and your friends, whatever, didn't get, didn't get a driver's license when they turned 16? Fewer of How many of y'all did not get your license when they Half of them. In my day, that was unthinkable. Because I need my freedom, I gotta have a car because I gotta get out, I gotta go places, do things, something, something, because ain't nothing going on at that. But what is it? I'm not saying those of you that raise your hand, but a lot of people nowadays, the kids, they're not so worried about driving because where are they gonna drive? They're just gonna drive somewhere to talk to the same people that are sitting there, they're texting and Instagramming, and Facebooking, and Snapchatting, and that kind of stuff. You don't have Facebook anymore. Uh, so, all that kind of stuff. Are you sitting at home playing video games, that kind of stuff, so the teenagers, you know, they're just going home and getting online and communicating with the same people so they don't need to drive anywhere. So the push of getting driver's license for kids lower, the push of going out and doing things lower, well, the one nice thing, get everybody sitting at home in a bedroom so that they ain't a teenage pregnancy ain't happening as much, teenage alcoholism ain't happening as much, because the teens aren't getting together physically, they're getting together online. 
And y'all know, y'all probably guilty of it. You sit across the table from whoever you touch them, right? Each other. I see a couple of heads shaking. So, who you are. So, um, so, in that case, so what's happening? The interest in teenagers in getting jobs is going down. But they don't need it because their hobbies and interests are like cheap. Their lost parents have an internet connection. Whatever. Right. <laughs> so they don't need as much money. So that they're not having kids, that kind of stuff. So the push for teenagers to enter the labor force is a lot lower. So we don't have as many kids entering the labor force until they turn 18, 20, 21, 23, so on. Which kind of a little bit works in the favor of y'all. Who are looking for a job because they're not competing against as many people. So guess what? Your employers don't have as many options, so they got to pay a higher wage. Right. Yeah, that works in your favor for those of you that are trying to get a job. So, uh, Going along with that pre teenage pregnancy bit that I just, just crossed my brain earlier. Overall, that labor supply curve shifts left for other reasons too, namely a rise in our living standards. Our quality of living in America has gotten pretty stinking good. Think about the kind of style, quality of living that your grandparents had when they were your age. I don't know, they're living in log cabin. No, they ain't that old. But you know, back, go back to, I don't know, like when my grandparents were, you know, back in like the 1950s or something like that. It was a car that family shared in the house, a car, a TV, maybe, a radio, no internet, no cell phones, none of that kind of stuff. Okay, and the expenses were higher, but now we've got more, better. That kind of stuff, so we don't, to a certain extent, we don't have to work as hard or something. It gets easier for some people to do the one parent keeps working, the other one stays home with kids. It's kind of easier to do that. The, the income transfer program, things like unemployment insurance, social security, welfare, Medicaid, those, Medicare, excuse me, uh, those things make it easier for people to stay out of work longer. If we didn't have unemployment insurance and you got fired, what are you doing? Calling somebody else for a job. You're, 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 even if you got to go to McDonald's or Burger King, you're going somewhere. But now if you lose your job, you can do what? You go to the Employment Security Commission and fill out some paperwork and they start mailing you checks every week. Yeah, every it's 35% of what you were making. Yeah. I still want to yeah. it's, it's a small percentage, but it's something. It keeps you from being so desperate that, oh crap, here I am with a PhD in nuclear physics and I gotta go cook French fries at McDonald's while I'm looking for the next job. It buys you some time. But hopefully, between that and the money, the income, the, the time, unemployment, that's the word. Hopefully, the, between the unemployment checks and the money that you have saved in your savings account, if, uh, that will buy you some time to do the job search and find your next real job. Instead of, oh crap, I've got to take whatever the next thing is I can find because I got bills I got to pay next week. So these transfer programs allow us to do that. Allow us to take more time to find the next good job instead of just the next job. The dating metaphor allows you to find Mr. Right instead of Mr. Right now. Right. That's a dating metaphor for this. Um, Another thing is the increased diversity and attractiveness of leisure activities. There's more stuff out there to distract us, to make us less willing to go out and work a little bit. We were talking about that with teenagers. But here's the thing. For the supply and demand for donuts, that shifts fluctuates every day. The supply and demand for gasoline, milk, that kind of stuff, it shifts every day. You go to the gas station every three days, the price, that, the price is different. Right? Because the price that they had to pay to put the gas in the tanks is different every day. The demand for you and I's customers is different every day, every week. It changes. But when it comes to the supply and demand for labor, it's not so smooth. Because you have a lot of jobs through lockdown. This is a full time job, eight to five. So the company's not going to say, well, it looks like our sales are going to be down 5% next week, so we need 5% less people. So instead of all y'all working 40 hours, Next week, y'all, everybody's to work 39. 
They don't do that. Or you can't say, well, I don't quite need enough of this much money, so I'm only going to come in 39 hours next week. Is that going to go over very well? No, you're also going to be like, I'm paying you 40 hours a week, shut up, you're here 40 hours a week, right? We need coverage, we need somebody sweeping the floors, answering the phone, whatever it is, 40 stinking hours a week. That's the job. So, we can do a little bit of, you know, little tweaks in supply and demand, cause little changes in price of gas, and sometimes gas is up a penny or two or whatever, you know. But you don't get these small little adjustments in labor, you end up with a bigger adjustment. When we're, our demand for our products causes us to get to the point where we're not just going to cut back everybody's hours by having we're going to fire somebody. That kind of thing. That's so. It's more in fits and starts instead of being nice and smooth. So. Monopsony. Don't read any of this. This word looks like what? Monopoly. And what is monopoly? Besides that game you hated when you were a kid. <laughs> because you, see, you used to beat your older brother in the game and then he would beat you with the game. Right. And you never finished a single round of the game your entire life without bleeding. Monopoly. We need to talk about something. I think we just did. Uh, what are the happiest days of my life? My brother and I, he just, they sent him off to military school for a couple of years and one of the heaviest days of my life is when we got the phone call. Joey had gotten in a fight with somebody in military school and they got him in a jaw with a baseball bat and broke his jaw. My brother Dave and I, oh, woo, celebration. Oh, that was the best Christmas Thanksgiving ever. But anyway, it's just Christmas. But I have no reason. <laughs> My smartboard has issues, but I don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So a monopsony, a monopoly is what? We have one business that controls all the selling or the production. A monopsony is when you have one business that controls all the hiring. Any of you from the Emporia area, if I was to use the word saddler, well, you know, okay, you're kind of getting where I'm going with it. Yeah. Right. You either work for somebody who is. Yeah. You either work for somebody that is a member of the Sadler family or you ain't working. Right. To have a monopsony situation, you're going to have one company that employs a large portion of the labor force, and labor force can't really leave. They're kind of stuck. And in that case, the company is a wage setter. I'm going to pay you what I'm going to pay, and you're going to take it, and you're going to like it, or else, what are you going to do? Who else is going to hire you? Because ain't nobody else but me. The example is West Virginia, back 100 years ago. Actually, a little over 100 years ago now. What's in West Virginia? Coal mines. Coal mines. The coal mines are where? They're in the hollers in between the two mountains in the valley. That's a holler, right? Not holler, but holler. Okay. So, you have mountain, you have mountain, and if you're going to be digging for the coal that's down here, do you want to start drilling from here? No, you want to start drilling from here. Right. So, you have coal lines load up there. No roads, no highways, no nothing like that because nobody has cars because there's nothing there except the railroad is coming through to load up the coal and leave. You either work for the coal mine or you're working for mom and dad. On the family farm, where you have the cows that have two short legs, two long legs, keep them rolling down the hill. Right? Toughest pig you ever eat. Yes. Tougher than wood. Tougher than woodpecker, it looks like. So, you can work for mom and dad. And was mom and dad paying you cash? No. You know, you're working helping them grow the cows and grow the crops, and they're paying you with, well, we gave you a roof over your head and we're cooking you food. And we're making you clothes, aren't we? Shut up, get back to work. Right? So you ain't getting paid cash. Even if you got paid cash, where'd you spend it? Because then nobody got a store there in town. So the only way that you get money is working with a coal mine. So people are like, okay, well, I'll work with coal mine, get a little bit of money so that I can actually own clothes that mama didn't make me. And maybe eat some food that mama didn't cook. And the coal mine people are like, well, this is the job. This is what we're going to pay, and these are the work conditions, and good luck. If you don't like it, shut up and get out. 
That's uh, that's a monopoly situation. So okay, well, enterprising. Okay, give me Jim Bob. Wait, Jim Bob. <laughs> Uphill, downhill, and he ends up in the next holler over after walking or hoboing on a train. And he's got a little stick little bag over. And so then, what happens when he's in the next holler? Who's he got to work for? Coal mine. Homer Simpson said the best. Don't. So, um, that's a monopsony situation. And you had it, so labor wages were ridiculously low in the coal mines in the 10s, 20s. Work conditions were terrible in there because, oh, we can spend money doing safety equipment and spending all this extra money and time to be, I don't know, reinforcing the ceiling of our coal mine. Well, if it collapses, well, people die, but we got plenty of other replacements we can send in there. What do we care? Why am I going to spend money on a hard hat? Well, if you get clunked in the head, well, I got somebody I can send you down near your place while you're healing. Why do I care? Work conditions terrible. So we had that right on these were the insurrection there where the National Guard was called out to deal with this in the 1920s. You don't really read about that in the history books, but there it was. Um, I try to remember the name of the town. Eight line may have been the town. But anyway. Is it an option? Is that ugly? Yeah. Yes. Ugly. So, what do you do about it? Start that company. David Dunn. Oh, okay. <laughs> David's like, yeah, start the company. Okay. Uh, but somebody's ready to beat you to it. Sorry. So, David's like, that sucks. Uh, I, David, I'm not happy only getting paid $30 an hour and I'm breathing in who knows what. I'm coming out with coughing and hacking and gagging and wheezing and that kind of stuff. So, David's going to come on. Oh, okay. I'm the evil. Like, you like, you're getting here. He's going to come and complain to me and I'm going to tell him, shut up and get out. I'm going to tell him, shut up, shut up, get back to work and I'm docking you an hour's pay. Or, shut up, I'm firing you. Get out. So what's they to do? He either quits or he just shuts up and goes back to work. I ain't paying you to be standing in my office complaining. I'm paying you to be digging coal. So David has no power. None of you have power as individuals. I'm going to see this light. I'm going to come back to it. So what do you do? David says, uh, this sucks. So if I quit or I complain, nothing's going to happen. But if we all complain, we got power. Because if we all say we want more pay, and when y'all are all standing in my office complaining at the same time, guess what? There ain't a bit of coal coming out of that hole, right? And my paycheck as a manager is based on coal coming out of the hole. So suddenly I have to listen, at least a little bit. So, but what do I tell you? David tells y'all this all the work there in this office complaining at the same time, so then what do I say? I ain't paying you to be standing in my office. Shut up and get back down in the hole. So that data gets slick and he's like, look, let's work together. If all of y'all give me, I don't know, 10% of your paycheck, then y'all give me a little bit of money and then I'll give you enough money that y'all hire me to negotiate on your behalf. And I get a higher, give you a higher pay rate, paycheck. Legalized, strong partner. You'll be better off. So then data comes into my office and he tells me, if you don't pay better, all your workers are going to stop working. And I can't tell them shut up and get back to work because he doesn't work for me. Right? But I got to listen. So he is a union rep. He's a union representative that y'all hired to so y'all negotiate collectively. That gives you power. Collectively, y'all have power. And that's what a union is. You work together to negotiate together because individually you do not have any power, but collectively you do have power. You're not happy with a t-shirt around here? One of you isn't happy and one of you goes to complain to the dean, okay, complain, noted. But if all of you go and complain to the dean, they're gonna notice something's gonna happen. And if all of you say, well, beep that sucker, and all of you, none of you sign up for any more classes with that instructor, and you all tell all of your friends, don't y'all sign up for any classes with that instructor, and then next semester that instructor shows up and they only have three people in all of their classes go, that person will lose your job, right? You all working together have power. Individually, not so much. So that's why unions ended up being formed, because you had monopsony situations 
the company owners were taking advantage of those workers that were trapped. I can't leave the hauler. Because they got back, they weren't even paying people with money. They were paying them with basically over glorified coupons that they had to cash in in the store that was owned by a company, a company script. So even if you did leave town, you live in town with a bunch of paper that you can't do anything with. It ain't like you got any money. So when you go to the next holler over, you're starting with nothing. So, and think about where, where, where are the unions we have? They generally tend to be rooted in places where there was, go back 100 years, where there's nothing else going on. The mountains of West Virginia, nothing else but coal mining. Michigan, nothing else but manufactured cars, and nothing else going on in Michigan there, even now. Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, steel mills, and nothing. Right? That's where the unions started popping up in places where there's only one thing going on and only the one thing and the people really didn't have any options to do anything else about it. So that's when unions come up. They work together to try to get better wages, get better work conditions. But they just like, I'm working for your benefit. I'm here for you, fellow workers. I'm going to get a higher pay rate pay for all of you. So you all Y'all come in and y'all threaten me, whatever. Well, y'all said David, he threatens me, so I y'all were getting paid three dollars an hour, and y'all threatened to to strike, which is y'all stop working. And then this game of chicken, who can go the longest? How long can y'all go without getting any paychecks? Versus how long can I go without getting called in the ground before the company headquarters in Charleston fires my butt? It's a game of chicken. And meanwhile, y'all are sitting home watching TV. Y'all have to be going out there keeping me from bringing in temporary replacements by threatening people like, you know, I hope, gee, I hope your house doesn't burn down while you're down there working for that evil blame me. Like, Jerry, you might be the manager of coal mine, but once you leave, you're just somebody else trying to get home. Yeah, but you're threatening, you're not threatening me, you're threatening, well, you know, you're just making suggestions toward possible replacement workers because there's other people in town y'all are staying y'all are like well i'm not going to work i'm going to say okay well don't work i'll bring in a replacement but y'all got to y'all got to keep people from coming in to replace you you got to make them too scared to come and replace you because you got to make sure that no coal is coming out of the ground so that's what the strike is about you have to be there so I'm like, just game with chicken so okay i surrender all of you are now getting paid eight dollars an hour instead of three dollars an hour and then I, as the manager, like, well, I do remember the uh, marginal fiscal product and marginal revenue product and all that kind of stuff. I'm sitting there saying, well, for one thing, when I'm also paying Connor $3 an hour for what little work he's doing for me, at $8 an hour, I don't think so. So maybe I got to let a couple of y'all go. All right. So higher wages will end up cutting because of unions. Can end up causing unemployment. If you stayed and kept your job, you're better off. You're working $3 an hour to $8 an hour. Woohoo! The first dollar that's going to date So you just went from three to seven, score. Y'all won. But if you lost your job like Connor, you lost. So even after you get the higher wages, are you you're still paying that union wages? Yes. Yeah, you, yes. Pay, you pay union dues. If you are part of a union, you pay union dues regardless. Well, I didn't realize that the union was always. Yeah. Yeah, because they, the contracts just, between the union and the company is only like three years, five years, something like that, then they have to renegotiate. So you got to keep on keep with the union. Uh, and the union has to just because David is negotiating on behalf of union members. And that labor agreement he's going to do is going to be between the union and the company. And David's going to be smart. He's got to be smart and say, force me to, among other things, guarantee that all my workers can be union workers. Because otherwise, okay, all y'all union people are going to get $8 an hour. Well, what am I going to start doing? I'm going to fire Jerry, and I'm going to hire a non-union person to take his place. And I'm going to pay them $3 an hour. I'm going to fire Haley, and I'm going to replace her with a $3 an hour person. Which because the contract extreme. has to be, one of the loophole with stipulation contract has to be X percentage of my workers has to be union workers. So guess what? Y'all have to be in the union. You don't have to pay union dues. You so work for a private company, not in a union, and you're competing in an industry with union companies. You're, I mean, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. So here's the thing, David. He just negotiated on y'all's behalf. He got y'all pay raises. 
but then he needs a pay. He wants a pay raise. So how's he going to get another pay raise? He's not going to get a pay raise for the next five, ten years until it's time for y'all's next negotiation. Prices go up every year, right? So what's he got to do? He's constantly out there trying to sign up more people to join his union. So he's going to the next holler over, the next holler over, and he's like, y'all hear sometimes about unions that are like, it's an auto manufacturer's union, and they security guards and teachers in that same union. I don't care, so I'm trying to get somebody to pay me some money to negotiate on their behalf. David doesn't care. He's moved on. And he'll just come back around when it's time to renegotiate for y'all. What? Let's talk about Matthew. I can't put a word here, so okay. Matthew, he did join the union. Because he didn't like David, and he don't want to pay David 10% of his paycheck. So all of y'all went on strike, gave me the bird, and are out there threatening anybody that's coming in. But Matthew was loyal to me. He kept coming to work every day, and he kept going down in the mines, and he kept working. So am I going to be so evil that, okay, I negotiated and gave y'all $8 an hour, but then the one person is loyal to me, I'm going to, sorry, you ain't in the union, I'm only going to give you three. Am I that blatantly evil? Probably. It's comedy we're talking about in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But what's going to tend to happen is Matthew would get a pay raise too. You know, he ain't in union. He's going to get bumped up to $8 an hour just like the rest of you. I might even get him more, but guess what? He ain't got to give a dollar every day. It's suddenly Matthew's in a better shape than the rest of you. Because he's going to benefit of the union without having to pay the union due. Even if I didn't give him a pay raise, he's still getting the benefit of the fact that. Because of y'all threatening, you know, I actually had to put, I don't know, put some lights on down there in mine. You know, get some hard hats and some safety supports to keep the ceiling from collapsing. So he still is going to benefit. So people outside the union can't benefit from the presence of the union. But you also have that unemployment piece. Having the presence of the union can cause unemployment to, in some cases, rather significant amounts. Yeah, but nowadays you also have these unions that are snapping up big contracts, and then the, the smaller companies that are not unionized have no way to compete in that market. Yeah, well, the but it's still company to company, the unions just have to put pressure on the company. Get contracts. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a mixed relationship with unions because I worked for a non unionized company, and then in the same industry, I worked for a unionized company. And for the union, we had everything. I mean, literally everything. Longer lunch breaks, more pay. We didn't have to do half the work. And when I worked for the other company, it was like we were competing against the unionized company. Yeah. You're competing and you compete. Which would y'all rather work? The company you don't have to work so hard and you get paid more, or the company where you gotta work harder and you get paid less. So everybody's gonna try to join the union if you're in a town that has union has some companies with union and some that don't. Martinsville and Henry County, where I live. Basically, basically, we were a half a dozen furniture companies, a half a dozen textile companies, and then a school system, a hospital, and a Walmart that supported the people that worked in those companies. That's pretty much our thing there. So our high schools are geared for graduating people to go to work in them, making t-shirts for your tables. Everything is geared toward that. So a lot of so our school system was well y'all know the way y'all are describing Brunswick County the other day. Is that in this button? Okay, okay, one of the other buttons we're talking about where Brunswick County. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just say part of you. No. Oh, oh ooh, you were in oh no, it's BA. Okay, you're saying I saw Brunswick got a sweater on those oh, sweaters were little crap up. So um we had those companies, and so back in the day, back when I was the all age, minimum wage like three thirty-five an hour. Then you had people who graduate high school and yeah, not the sharpest schools in the tool shed, but you know, minimum wage like three thirty-five an hour, and you got these people that are making twelve, fifteen dollars an hour. Very good pay for working in that area. But you had people like David that he's already negotiated a deal for y'all. And the only way he's going to give himself an increase in pay is go and negotiate another deal, get more people in his union. So somewhere along the line, some people like David showed up in Henry County and started saying, hey, look what I did for this group, look what I did for that group. Well, y'all join my union, give me some money, and I'll do the same for you. 
So what ended up happening is finally one of the unions took hold in one of the companies. And they ended up negotiating. And so I'm going to make up numbers here. So the salaries of maybe $150 an hour to like 17 or 18 in that one company. So then everybody in town wants to work where? At that one company. So what ended up happening? Two things. Number one, the other companies were like, oh crap, we're even going to lose our good workers to that other company, or we got to get pay raises. But in the meantime, the other workers in the county were like, dude, they can do it $18 an hour for the same worker we get 50. Sign me up, David. I want to join your union too. So suddenly we went from having no unions, the unions hit two thirds of those companies in like a year. Salaries got negotiated up in like a year. And the companies sat around and they want to go forward. And they said, oh, Sam, it's bad enough. I have to play these people that graduated from Martinsville and Law Park and Bassett. It's bad enough I had to went ahead paying $12 an hour or $15. Now I got to pay $18 an hour. And hmm, let me do the math. There's some people in China that are willing to do manufacturing work for like $3 an hour. Did a little bit of math, did a little bit of that, and it's about three dollars an hour back then the average manufacturing salary here. So they like do the math, do the math. It's cheaper for us to make our t-shirts in China and float them across the ocean than it was to pay these people eighteen dollars an hour. So what ended up happening? We lost most of our big employers in Martinsville. We went from having like ten of those companies to like three of them. You think the economy around here is kind of sucks? Martinsville and Danville, which is the Pennsylvania County, has it still to this day had the highest unemployment rates in the state. We got absolutely ripped. I'm not saying unions were all of that, but unions were part of the piece. Yeah. I'm but the other thing is, some of those companies were owned by like the Bassett, Bassett Furniture, Stanley Furniture, Stanley. their family. And who is on the board of the county? Board of whatever Super Board of Supervisors, members of the Bass and Stanley, those families. So what are they doing? They just had the system. They weren't. They had all the eggs in one basket, and they owned the basket. So they're trying to. Were they trying to bring in any computer companies? No. Were they trying to bring in anything else? No. Were they trying to? No. They were just working the system and put as much money in their pockets as they could. No diversity. All their eggs in one basket. When that basket cracked. A bunch of ridiculous on ground metaphorical stuff. Corporate greed, but there was worker greed. Both the, both sides equally guilty. Can you fault the companies for saying that eighteen dollars an hour versus three dollars an hour? Can't really fault them for that because they're like, well, guess what? There's Chinese T-shirts being made for three dollars an hour anyway whether our name is on it or not, but at least if we get our t-shirts made over there, at least some of the profit is gonna come back to the United States, at least some of the designers and that kind of stuff you here in the United States will keep your jobs. We can't compete if to a $3 an hour t-shirt when we're paying $18 an hour. If we leave alone, we're gonna be run out of business in a year or two. The companies kind of found themselves, they didn't really have much choice but to do the outsourcing. And it's because we want higher minimum wages, we want better working conditions, we got unions, we got greedy, all of that. We as workers, we as people, we want high speed internet. All right. So. Okay. So that was like way more about unions than I was expecting to do, but okay, there we go. So, an oligopsony. Simply the oligopoly for those of you that, well, We'll talk about those in a few weeks, actually, thank you, but um, an oligopoly, an oligopsony is when you have more than one, but only a few companies that control all the hiring in the area. In this case, the workers have options. Not many options, maybe, but they do still have options. A teenager, I don't, you know, I don't have to work at McDonald's, I could go to Burger King, I could go to Wendy's, I could go to Taco Bell. So I have options for where I work. So what will end up happening is the companies are going to tend to compete. 
to the his own. But let's assume there is a Hardee's and Wendy's Burger King and a Taco Bell in Alberta, and let's assume that there's a high school in Alberta. Okay, let's just, so. You only got four restaurants in town, and if all four of them are paying the exact same wages, then you got all these 16 year olds in Alberta High. Where are they going to apply to first? It don't matter. So just whichever store they get to. So McDonald's is getting a quarter, going to get a quarter of the good ones and a quarter of the bad ones. Taco Bell's going to get a quarter of the good ones, a quarter of the bad ones. Burger King's going to get a quarter of the good workers, a quarter of the bad ones. Are you okay with only having a quarter of your workers being the good workers and then the other three quarters are like average or below? Hey, George's okay with that. A lot of companies, maybe not so much. So, if we want to get better, so what do we do? Oh, yeah, they're all paying seven and a quarter an hour. I'm going to pay $7.50 an hour. So then every teenager is going to apply where first? At the higher paying place first. So then they get first choice. So then all the good workers and bad workers are going to apply to that restaurant first, and that restaurant's going to do what? They're going to hire all the good workers, right? And then leave all the bad ones for McDonald's and Burger King to fight over. Right. But is McDonald's and Burger King going to be okay with that? No. Well, so what's going to happen? They're going to raise their wages too. And maybe they're going to raise it higher than the first than Taco Bell did. And then, so you'll end, up with a, you'll end up with a war there. A wage war. They can do is sell that formula for determining a good worker site on the If you can do that, you can save the power of money. Take my business for by plus. Human resources. So, um, so you would end up with this competition there. And that's what's generally going to happen there. But, imagine this. Okay, so if we were all, so the stores were all paying seven and a quarter an hour, suddenly seven fifty, seven seven five, eight, nine. Next thing it ends up, they, they finally they let the same store sell out. Now every fast food joint in town is paying twelve dollars an hour just because and they're still back to getting a quarter of the good ones and a quarter of the bad ones. That kind of sucks for the store owners, right? So imagine if you will. Picture hey. Manager McDonald's, the manager of Burger King, Taco Bell, Wendy's, they all, I don't know, they get together in the back room of Brian Steakhouse here in South Hill. And they're just having a local industry wide meeting. And just while they're there, they just sit there and they say, look, we could compete with one another and drive our wages way high and not really gain anything, just sort of screw ourselves up. Or let's just agree to you never pay more than seven and a quarter, I'll never pay more than seven and a quarter. So we all just pay the same seven and a quarter, and we're all going to be stuck with the same 25% of the good ones and 25% of the losers, but that's okay because that's what the end result would be if we tried to compete anyway. So let's just agree to keep the wages as low as possible. Can you see them doing that? Absolutely. Abs freaking loot lane. It doesn't make sense for them to do that. Absolutely. That's kind of the situation in Blackston right now where none of the fast food restaurants are paying more than seven and a quarter. Um, I think one of them pays an eight an hour, but they don't hire many people and both retail stores and Blackstone are actually now. Right. Here's the thing. They can negotiate. Well, there's a problem with that. No, it's illegal. If they agree to let's all set wages to be the same, it's illegal for them to do that. But even if they did do it and get away with it, can you see Burger King saying, Yeah, I know I'm only supposed to pay seven and a quarter an hour, but I've got this real good worker coming in. Sam is coming to apply, and I know that boy's got game. And so I want to make sure that he doesn't walk out the door and go work for the competition. So maybe I'll just say, I'm telling you about it, I'm going to pay you seven and, seven and a half an hour. Can you see that happening? So the incentive the cheats can end up happening, so the whole agreement's going to blow up and go out the window anyway. No. In the case of Blackstone, they're not getting together and negotiating. Yeah. But what is happening, luckily, in Blackstone, they have enough supply of labor, there's enough workers out there that they're like, we've got plenty to choose from, we don't have to push prices, we don't have to push wages, because 
Yeah, we can all go back over. There's a hundred graduates coming from the high school, but between the six employee, the employers, they only need 20 of them. So all of the workers that are going to get hired are going to be in the top 25% of the graduating class from high school. So then there's no need to push it. You would end up having to push it when the bulk of the workers are going to get hired, and so then you're running a risk of losing good ones and having to replace them with bad ones instead of losing good ones, replacing them with almost as good. And so, so they ain't negotiating behind the scenes because they will go get so big trouble if they were to do that. So we've done all the first slides today. So, uh, the minimum wage, we all know what that is, right? It's the least money they can get away with paying you. How's that for respect? I'm going to pay you the least that I can get away with. How would you put it now? Sounds, sounds harsh. Exactly, yeah, but that's absolutely what it is. And that's what you've got to sort of hold on to when you mind. So, here's that. The U.S. government suggests so it's seven and a quarter an hour. It is not a law. Each state sets their own minimum wage. The federal government says, well, we think it should be seven and a quarter an hour. You're welcome to go above that. You're welcome to go below that. This is what we think, and this is the number that we're going to use in doing our calculations, and we're going to be doing our calculations on things like welfare benefits, social security checks, that kind of stuff that we'll talk about later in the semester. Individual states, you can look at a map if you want to go, oh, where is the table? Um, states that have a minimum wage greater than the federal minimum wage, there is 29 of them plus the Washington, plus Washington, D.C. The highest one, probably the leading one, still should be the state of Washington. We talked about before the prices go up every year. Will needs to make sure that if the price of the sun drop is going up every year, he needs his paycheck to go up by that same amount each year, right? So as a cost of living adjustment, <laughs> these state, this Washington was like one of the first ones, they started adjusting every year, years ago. Prices went up by 3%, we're going to raise minimum wage 3%. Prices go up by 5 we're going to raise minimum wage by 5%. So minimum wage in the state of Washington is $12 an hour. Minimum wage in Ottawa, Maine is $11 an hour. Ooh, Washington, D.C. is 13 and a quarter. Well, I mean, that is so expensive. Yeah. Uh, but you have 29 states plus Washington, D.C. that has a minimum wage above seven and a quarter an hour. We have, we have 16 states that are holding to the federal recommendation of seven and a quarter an hour, and unfortunately, Virginia and our near neighbor, North Carolina, are two of those. What is CMI? I mean, CNMI? Uh, I don't know. That's a that hasn't been on the list yet. All of it is it an island? Yeah, it's gonna be an island. That's what the I is. I'm trying to come up with what the central New Mexico island. <laughs> Not quite. It has because what what's happened is that they've broken down. They've added uh, Guam and Virgin Islands here that have never been specified before. Since the last time I looked oh. at this, so this is gonna be. Some I don't I don't know. I'll have to Northern look area on an island. The Northern Mariana. Can you look? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Was, the Marianas. Okay. Don't that, know what the C stands. Seven islands. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they're going to be Central Pacific Islands. Things like the Marianas were like Tinian and Saipan. Well, not Saipan. No. no. Yeah. Midway. I would be. Or Saipan is in the okay. Um, just Tinian Island. That's where they uh, launched the Atomic Pivot. B29 should probably talk about bombs on here, and not talking to this. Y'all knew that already, so. So, cheap to live in. So, there are five states where there is no minimum wage. 
There used to be a few of them that had, had this, but that were in this list, but it, this has changed as of January. This, this is in Mississippi, South Carolina. So that's been yeah. 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 Just yeah. with the new, the, there were some laws passed yeah. that's of January yeah. one. This table got resettled, and that's why I'm like, okay. Uh, but yeah, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee. Economically speaking, what's happening in those states? Nothing. So it's not like, well, that means you, you only got to pay your workers three dollars an hour. Or, or we only got to pay fifty cents. What it's saying is, there's no minimum. If you can find somebody that's willing to work for seven dollars an hour, good on you. If you can find somebody that's willing to work for your five dollars an hour, good on you. If you're willing to work for five dollars an hour, good on you. We're just not limiting your negotiating power one way or the other. Because these states, there ain't a whole lot going on, and they're trying to attract business in any way that they can. And one of the tools they're using to try to bring business into the state is you're welcome to negotiate whatever deal you can negotiate. But you're not going to be going into those states finding a bunch of people that are working for $3 an hour. Just ain't going to happen. It just, they're just not putting a forced floor to that negotiation. But let's just say, if you live on the South Carolina border, if you live near the border, South Carolina, North Carolina, but you'd be paying much less than seven and a quarter. No, you'd be paying about the same wages you're paying in North Carolina, right? Or else everybody's going to drive across the state. You know, drive across the state line in order to get a job. Same thing, Georgia. There, Georgia is yeah. They're seven and a quarter an hour, so the southern half of South Carolina, you know, people can go to Georgia too. But if you're down in the heart of Alabama where you've only got to go to Mississippi or Louisiana. Oh, yeah. you're if you're in the heart of Alabama, yeah, you kind of screwed. Yeah. Yes. Um, move five or south and work in Florida Panhandle or go to Georgia or south. But so but like but you're not gonna be finding people out there working three dollars an hour. There's still probably more someone who be making seven and a quarter an hour because even if you don't have to pay the minimum wage, you kind of are gonna have a hard time looking somebody in the eye and explaining to them. The people that graduated in some of the worst education systems in the country and try to explain to them that, yeah, I know the federal number is 725, but it's only a suggestion and I'm only going to pay you seven and a quarter. What? The minimum wage is seven and a quarter. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be seven and a quarter. Not officially, but unofficially, it's probably going to end up being seven and a quarter anyway, because you're going to have a hard time trying to explain that to people without ticking them off. Right. So if they get on the opposite thing, will they get in trouble? Yeah, uh, no, it depends on who you pay. It depends on how they achieve that monopsony status. So, if they achieved it through, we're purposely going to run people out of business so we can take over, they're going to get in trouble. But if it happened kind of naturally, same thing for monopoly that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. If it happened more naturally, the government's going to be a lot more forgiving about it. But if you decide to, okay, out there in the heart of Mississippi, 30 miles outside of Meridian, where there's absolutely nothing going on, and you want to go down here and set up a company, you end up being the only employer in town, or you're the only employer in town. That ain't being evil. Don't talk about the companies going into this. Oh, now that as far as the negotiating oligopsony, no, because that, that's illegal, that's collusion, and they'll give us. It happens all the time, depending on who, what attorneys they pay, and what lobbyists they pay, and who they're paying off. I guarantee you, it happens all the time. The fact that it's illegal does not stop people from doing but, it. But it's only what you could cause. Yeah. Well, here's you think that, but it doesn't happen as often as you think. Because it doesn't have to, because we have history. Because we're going to talk about this when we get to monopolies here a little bit, or oligopolies. But there's going to be historical precedent for things. Like, uh, okay, I'm going to use example of an oligopoly thing. When have you ever seen Coke and Pepsi on sale at the same time? You don't. Because why do you go on sale? I'm going on sale this week, so my price is cheaper, so I can steal customers away from them. But if I lower my price, they lower their price at the same time. What did we do? Nothing other than give away money, right? So Coke and Pepsi is never going to lower their price at the same time. But it's not like the head of Coke and the head of Pepsi is going to get in the back office somewhere and say, "Well, we're going to go on sale the third week end of the month," and oh, well, okay, well we'll go on sale second week. They ain't going to do that. But they've established a historical pattern of. 
Coke always is on sale the second week of the month. Pepsi's always on sale the first week of the month, and we're just sticking to that same historical pattern. That kind of stuff will happen, and that's perfectly legal. But this is where we've always gone on sale. And so you can end up with as far as hiring and that kind of stuff and stuff. It's going to be sort of something they're not going to be colluding, but they're going to be sitting there looking at the level of the workers they're, they're getting in, and they're going to be doing whatever just or all second unwritten stuff. Yeah, it's going to be unwritten rule, unwritten and undiscussed. It's just if that's the way, maybe that was the way we did it the one time we did get together and make an illegal agreement, but that agreement doesn't happen anymore, but we're just sort of sticking to the same pattern. It's just like racism legally ended in, 19, in 1864. Racism didn't actually end until sometime in the future, right? Because we ain't got there yet. Just ask our governor. I shouldn't have said that while I'm recording. Because he's my boss's 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 boss. But I'm just saying, right? So, you know, there's still some patterns, historical patterns that exist. Anyway, so, um, and I'm trying to figure out if there's anything I can say in recording to save my butt, and I'm like, I think. So, um, bye. I'll see y'all in the unemployment line uh, <laughs> soon, and we will pick up and talk more about it in the week, whatever they do. Next Thursday. Oh, I don't have time to go here. Something joke and something else. Yeah. So, like,